Intel Core i9-11900K. I'm going to pretty much dive straight into the review. If you need a background on what is Rocket Lake or what fabrication processes Intel used for this processor, then I recently did a video on Rocket Lake, which is Intel 11th gen for the desktop, and I did a more recent video on Intel Adaptive Boost, which I will cover briefly uh, as this review goes on. But if you don't know what either of those two things means, for goodness sake, go back because you don't want a whole load of repeated yada yada here. But to summarize, we've known for ages that 11th gen Rocket Lake was going to be eight cores at the high end where Comet Lake 10th gen had been up to 10 cores. In other words, a step backwards. And this is because Intel couldn't do 10 nanometer. Their new cores were bigger. Deb Bauer has demonstrated just how much larger. Again, I covered this in a recent video. And therefore, they could only cram up to eight cores in the processor die. Even though the die is significantly larger than Comet Lake, it's still only eight cores rather than 10. And that begged the question, if the new i9 was going to be up to eight cores and the i7 was going to be up to eight cores, what was an i9 in this day and age? And at first, according to Intel, the answer was thermal velocity boost, i.e. a couple of cores would turbo particularly fast, just as they had with Comet Lake. And that wasn't really very exciting. Then last week, frankly, all hell broke loose when ASUS released uh, some beta biases, as I said in this Adaptive Boost video, uh, which essentially told us about Adaptive Boost. Intel hadn't told us. So we went back to Intel and said, what's this all about? They said, ah, Adaptive Boost. And the best way of describing Adaptive Boost is it's a bucket of boost. Uh, much as AMD's been doing for some while, Intel will look at the processor, look at the motherboard, look at the power, look at the cooling, and go, how fast can this processor run? And it will just go for it. They're talking about 5.2 gigahertz all cores, something in that region, which when you consider uh, we're expecting one or two cores to go to maybe 5.3, the idea of all, all eight cores going at 5.2 is like, well, wow. And immediately you think, power, this might get juicy because whereas the Comet Lake S 10 core i9 10900K uh, ran very fast, 4.9 all cores, it was juicy. It wasn't especially hot because Intel was using a thing they called a stim soldered TIM, soldered thermal interface material. We get more of that in Rocket Lake. So there were some unknowns. There's also an unknown about pricing. We now have UK pricing and it's blooming dreadful. So I'm going to show you the bias of this system and I'm going to give you two quick runs just to demonstrate adaptive boost. Uh, I'll do a Cinebench run uh, and then you'll know where we're at and then we can talk turkey about other benchmarking. Before I proceed, if you haven't yet clicked the subscribe button for Kit Guru Tech, please do and similarly, please ring that bell. So my review system here consists of this mighty ASUS ROG Maximus 13 Hero. We've got 32 gigabytes of Corsair LPX DDR4 3600 megahertz memory. The processor obviously is the Core i9-11900K. This hefty great big 360 mil cooler from MSI is the MPG Core Liquid KL360. I've done another separate video which covers a handful of MSI motherboards and this cooler. I don't know when that's going up in relation to this video. Hopefully the editor's gonna stick a link somewhere around to help you out. The SSD Sabrent Rocket 4.0 M.2 NVMe because of course Rocket Lake now supports PCI Express Gen 4. Hurrah for that. Graphics card is a Sapphire Radeon RX 6800 XT 16GB, which of course is Gen 4. Power supply, Seasonic Prime Platinum 1300 watts. We don't need all 1300 watts. We don't need much of the 1300 watts, but we like efficient power supplies. Platinum does it for me. Running on Windows 10 Pro. So let's just take a look at the BIOS here. BIOS version is 0610X64, which at the moment is a beta BIOS. And you can see we've got the i9-11900K. Go into the extreme tweaker. And here you can see what's going on with the turbo. And we do not have an AVX offset. 5.3 gigahertz is the target. 
overclock tuning, we're going to put that on XMP just as you'd expect. And now you can see the memory's ramped up to 3600. And we'll go down to Intel Adaptive Boost, enable it, and we save. Cinebench R15. Process is running at 5 gigahertz all cores, 5.1 all cores. Temperature is 78, 5.1, and we're drawing 260 watts package power. That was down there. One ninety two sixty three watts CPU alone, and it needs a bit of cooling. Back in the BIOS, let's disable Intel Adaptive Boost technology. And do it again. And again, Cinebench R15, 4.8 gigahertz, package power is 185 watts. And we're done. Now here's the thing, Intel had fully intended to launch Rocket Lake whilst keeping we, the reviewing media, in the dark about that adaptive boost technology. Which strikes me as just extraordinary, because the thing is, adaptive boost only works with a combination of the new Core i9 and a Z590 motherboard. If you've got an H570 or a B560 or a Core i7 or you know any other permutation, you don't get the adaptive boost. Adaptive Boost, if you flip it around, gives you a reason, possibly, to want to buy the new Core i9 over the Core i7, or indeed to plump for a Z590 motherboard. And the only explanation I can come up with is that it's tricky to make it work correctly, and the motherboard manufacturers weren't entirely sure that they could get it out on time. Well, okay. But don't forget, Z590 launched at CES the first week of this year, back in January. The processors have been sloshing around in development for absolutely ages. We know they've been out there for testing for months, and yet Adaptive Boost, we weren't even supposed to know about it, let alone to use it. Which is just bizarre. As I go through my graphs, you need to keep an eye on the two bar charts. Uh, one is 11900K with Adaptive Boost off, and the other with it on. If you plug the i9 into a non-Z motherboard or you choose not to use Adaptive Boost, you're getting quite a different experience to with Adaptive Boost on. And here's the big question uh, I think you should be asking yourself throughout this, which is, do you think that Intel has achieved its uh, goal of the 19% IPC increase, which means that this new 8-core is at least on a par with the previous Core i9-10900K. Because, you know, otherwise they are truly making a step back. And also, of course, we have the question, how does it compare to the Ryzen 7 5800X, AMD's 8-core? I'll come to pricing in a little while. So let's do some graphs. We look at 3D Mark Time Spy. This is just the CPU test, and the 10 Core i9 10900KF is at the top of the chart. Then we have the new Core i9, and then the Ryzen 7. Scores, there's a reasonable degree of separation. Intel's looking good here. 7 zip. AMD at the top, the 10 Core behind, and then the new Core i9. 7 zip decompressing. Ryzen 7, 10 Core and then the new Core i9. Memory bandwidth, obviously a purely synthetic test, the brand new Core i5 at the top of the chart, then the new i9, and then it's a bit of a mix, AMD down the bottom. So a clear win for Intel. Memory copy, look at that, a clear win for the new Core i9. Blender Classroom, at the top we have the old Core i9 with 10 cores, we have the new Core i9 with adaptive boost on, we have Ryzen 7 5800X, and then we have Core i9 with Adaptive Boost off. So, if we didn't have Adaptive Boost, AMD would be looking really good. As it is, they'd just get beaten. Cinebench R15, multi-core, 
win for AMD, and then we get the 10 core, and then we get the new Core i9. Cinebench R15 single core. Oh look, once again AMD at the top, Intel close behind. Cinebench R23, the new version of Cinebench. Well there we go, Intel, the 8 core with adaptive boost on, just beats out the old 10 core. This, I think, is the slide that Intel is going to be particularly happy to see. After that, we have AMD, and then we have the i9 with adaptive boost off. So, without adaptive boost, just look at how that graph sits. Cinebench R23, single core, new core i9, winner. Conversely, CPU power draw in Blender. I mean, it's just horrible, isn't it? So we have the old 10 core Core i9 at 231 watts, and either side of it, we've got the 8 core i9 11900K. That graph is telling you how much the 40 nanometer process is hurting Intel. CPU temperature. Now you have to consider I'm using this hefty great big MSI cooler. It's got a fan blowing around the CPU socket under this shroud. Uh, we've got Ace Tech 7th generation technology. It's a good one, no doubt about it. Look at the difference it makes whether or not you're using adaptive boost. I mean, it's no huge surprise that there's some difference, but either this new i9 is cool as anything at 66 degrees or it's working hard at 77. Then we get on to gaming. Okay, so Deus Ex at 4K. What can you say apart from the older processors down the bottom, AMD in the middle, new processors up the top? Deus Ex at 1440, a clear win for Intel. Deus Ex at 1080, AMD's pulling back a bit. However, Intel looking good once again with Rocket Lake. Far Cry 5 New Dawn at 4K. There's frankly nothing to choose between the processors. The frame rates are so close at 4K. However, Intel wins with Rocket Lake. 1440p, Intel wins with Rocket Lake. 1080p, Intel wins with Rocket Lake. Clean sweep for Intel. Watch Dogs Legion, 4K, there's nothing to split them. It's all down to the graphics. Watch Dogs Legion, 1440, very, very similar. So Intel is down the bottom, but by one or two frames. And it's a very similar story at 1080p in Watch Dogs Legion, so I don't think we're going to put too much store by that. Handbrake. Handbrake H.264 encoding, it's down to CPU grunt. So the 10-core Intel is up the top, then we have Ryzen 7, then we have Rocket Lake. H.265 encoding, now this is a funny one. H.265 is supposed to be slightly more sophisticated and yet the Ryzen 7 stomps it. And then we have Rocket Lake with adaptive boost on. Then we have Comet Lake S 10 core. Then we have Rocket Lake with adaptive boost off. I didn't quite expect to see that. Pricing. Obviously, times are peculiar to say the least. The great shortage continues to impact us. The prices of the three new processors we care about, the i5 11600K is £249, the i7 11700K, Gamers Nexus called that a waste of sand, which was harsh, £400, I'm expecting an i7 in the very near future, looking forward to seeing what that's like. Then we have the i9 11900K, and I reckon that was going to be priced around the £500 mark. However, uh, preliminary UK prices seem to be 540 or 560 pounds. That, I mean, that's horrible. That, that's just horrible. That makes the Ryzen 7 5800X look like a complete bargain. Also, it's saying that you're paying over 100 pounds, but more like 150 pounds for the benefit of the i9 over the i7, which is a bit of speed plus the adaptive boost. And that strikes me as just extraordinary. I'm going to say under no circumstances should you consider buying the new Core i9 for £560. I don't think you should pay £500. I think for that sort of money you should be looking at the current uh, Core i9 10850K and uh, 10900 if you can buy them at the right money because they're pretty blooming cheap. They are head-to-head -head with Ryzen 7. This processor at that money strikes me as just wrong. And yet, I know it makes no difference what I say because the big shortage means if it's on the shelf, someone's going to buy it. And if you buy this processor, whether you pay £400, £500 or £600, it's a perfectly decent processor. The question of whether you should use adaptive boost is a vexed question. 
Now, I'm not the least bit happy that this motherboard and a stack of the other motherboards I have have got beta BIOS to support adaptive boost. Uh, it's not, as far as I can see, a baked in technology. I'm sure there'll be um, legit biases on the motherboard manufacturers' websites any day now. But right now, it feels like it's still a work in progress. The gaming results didn't seem to benefit from adaptive boost at all. Basically, if you're doing something that's incredibly CPU grunty, Blender, that type of thing, Cinebench, then give it the max. You know, you want the extra bit of performance, the extra 400 megahertz, and damn the power and the 10, 11 degrees Celsius. Well, okay. But surely common sense says if you're determined to have mega CPU grunt, you don't muck around with an 8-core Intel or the previous 10-core Intel. You go for a 12-core AMD or a 16-core AMD. You go for Threadripper, you know, 24 cores, 32 cores. Why would you mess around with is this 8-core going to do the trick? But you might argue that it's a one-click overclock. You go in the BIOS, you turn Adaptive Boost on, you hammer the JSs out of your processor, you either let it settle down and light load, or you go back in the BIOS and switch it off. I mean, that seems a bit much to me. But it's possible. But I cannot help but think that Adaptive Boost is Intel's way of just making sure that they can take the fight to AMD, because they may indeed have achieved their 19% increase in IPC with Rocket Lake, but you have to really pick the use case. And to my mind, they simply haven't. The 14 nanometer process has knackered Rocket Lake. That's all there is to it. This processor was never intended to be. They've kind of muddled through this launch. The big question for me actually is, why has Intel even bothered to launch Rocket Lake? I think it's so the likes of Samsung and Western Digital and so on can sell Gen 4 SSDs. They don't have to, you know, ally themselves to AMD. Now the industry is Gen 4. Gen 4 graphics, Gen 4 storage, and whatever the next fast PCI Express stuff might be. And it's worth noting, incidentally, one of the aggravating factors of working with Z590 is... The new processors have 20 lanes of Gen 4. The old processors, 10th Gen, have 16 lanes of Gen 3 well, from the CPU plus uh, PCI Express from the chipset. On all the 500 series motherboards that I've seen, the top M.2 slot is powered by the processor. If you use an 11th Gen processor, you've got four lanes of PCI Express Gen 4 to that M.2. If you plug in a 10th Gen processor, that M.2 goes dark because you've got 16 lanes from the CPU going to the graphics. You haven't got the four for the storage. And that just strikes me as bizarre. It's even made me think, oh, I think Intel would have done better with Rocket Lake to have changed the processor socket and added or removed a pin. But the fact they've stuck with the same socket as Z490 and Comet Lake, I actually think was something of a mistake. I think the step to PCI Express Gen 4 and changing the number of lanes of PCI Express, I think they should have changed the socket. And I've never said that before. I've usually berated Intel for changing sockets. In this instance, I think it's the right move. I think the problem is this processor was not expected to exist. I would also say this. Intel Adaptive Boost has basically killed overclocking. There is zero point, in my opinion, attempting to overclock this processor Adaptive Boost does it for you. You can see this processor arrived already running very, very juicy. It draws far too much power to my mind for eight cores because it shouldn't be on 14 nanometer. Turn on Adaptive Boost and the power draw just goes absolutely crackers. So yes, Adaptive Boost has kind of covered Intel's uh, embarrassment, but goodness gracious me, doesn't that seven nanometer process from TSMC used by AMD doesn't that look good? So, Rocket Lake is here. You shouldn't buy this processor, certainly not for that money, but you're probably going to buy it anyway, so there's not much point in me saying any more.